Today, I'm joined by Manly Hopkinson, who is nothing short of incredible. Through two stints in the Navy, around the world yacht race, a race to the North Pole, writing a book and consulting to companies on leadership, Manly really has packed a lot into his life so far. Let's have a walk through that journey. Hi Manly, uh, thank you for coming on today. Hi Nick, my pleasure, great to be here. So, let's, uh, let, let's take the story to the start. So, uh, young Manly looks at joining the Navy. Uh, what, what inspired that decision? I, I must confess I didn't actually look to join the Navy. I was going to be an architect first, um, but... Um, okay. <laughs> exactly. It all bit, went badly wrong, actually, the week before Freshers Week. I had rugby training week and I enjoyed myself too much, so I left after about a year and a bit. Um, I ended up running a pub, and there's a very good mate of mine's mother who said, Manny, stop mucking around, just join the Navy. So, all right, I will. Dad was Navy, so I come from a Navy background. So, yeah, I ended up joining with a bit of, bit of a hiatus between <laughs> school and actually starting. So it wasn't the first choice, you know what I mean? But it, I guess it's where I should have been anyway. Uh, what job did you join to do in the Navy? Um, rugby, sailing, um, all that sort of stuff. I was a, I was a weapons engineer. So uh, obviously went to Dartmouth and then to Manhattan uh, Engineering College in Plymouth. Uh, and then you know, back into that bit. But I didn't actually stay very long. Okay, so what, what, was, what was life like having, uh, having joined the Navy, done your initial training? I, I actually really enjoyed it. I, I had the sort of philosophy that, that you know, the early training, is, as you know, with all, all the forces, they, they sort of beast you and you know, get you up on Dartmoor, sort of February, at sort of for a week, non-stop training and this sort of stuff. A chap I, I befriended pretty uh, quickly was a guy called Steve French, who was uh, an upper yardsman. So he actually came up through the ranks to him an officer. He, so was a bit of, he knew a bit, bit of what he's doing and how the system worked. And you can imagine the scene, you're out in Dartmoor and you're in your fatigues and you've got your rucksack. And there's one early evening where you had a bit of time to yourself. And so we found a flat rock in sort of in the side of a hedge and got out of our Bergen's, got a white tablecloth and a candelabra and silver cutlery for our mess dinner, which we thought was quite funny, but we ended up having to carry a large rock with us for the next two days after that. <laughs> but my, my attitude was, you know, they're not trying to kill me. They're, they're trying to build you, make you, grow you, expose you, all that sort of stuff. So I, I really enjoyed Dartmouth, actually, I must admit. Uh, and Dartmouth training ship, um, great fun. Actually got best officer under training there. It all went downhill from there, by the way, but the, I started well and got stuck in for sure. And I, I you know, I enjoy the camaraderie. I, I, I'm happy with a bit of order and structure, but I'm also quite happy in my own space too. So a bit of both, really. So uh, when finishing training, where, where was the first post in? Um, well, well, I did my degree in the Navy, so I at the Naval College in Plymouth. Uh, and then I actually was going to uh, transfer to the Marines. And uh, at that time, I was, uh, it wasn't, there wasn't a standard route to go Navy Marines. And I was, I was captain of rugby at the time. And the, the padre, it was a Greenberry padre, a Royal Marine padre, a chap called uh, uh, Clive. He said, man, yeah, you should be a good Marine. You, you'll do that. So I went off and did my potential officer's course uh, uh, to join the Marines, which I passed. But at the same time as doing that, I happened to notice in the sort of supplements of the Sunday papers, an advert saying Royal Hong Kong Police you know, come out here. So I did an interview for that too. Uh, and so then in the first, in the same week, I got one letter from the Marines saying, yeah, come here. Another one from Hong Kong saying, come here. So I thought, South Devon, South China. So I, I actually left the Navy completely before serving any proper sea time. I had one small ship. Uh, and then found myself out in Hong Kong, the Royal Hong Kong Police back in um, 85, which is something very different and great fun. Wow, so a very brief stint in the Navy followed oh, yes. by... Off to Hong Kong. Yeah, so four years in the Navy, off to Hong Kong. It was amazing. 85, Hong Kong's a very different place than it is now. It was still, if you like, the dying embers of the British Empire. It was our last bit of land, if you know what I mean. Um, you, you go to peace training school, you're taught law, which is handy, taught Cantonese, so you can speak Cantonese as well. I've lost a lot of uh, the, the grammar now uh, and, and uh, vocabulary. But then you're out there, and I was in the Marine Police, <clears throat> so you're in charge of one of the boats, you go straight in as an inspector, and I, had a, I really enjoyed it, it got stuck in. And then I did one tour, but stayed in Hong Kong, uh, and set up a marine servicing business. I, I'm a sailor by background, all my life I've been sailing. I did have a slight problem with a couple of triads, and had to leave Hong Kong in a hurry, but I won't tell that full story now. <laughs> uh, and, and hid in Papua New Guinea for six months, which is quite a handy place to be. Then end up back in the UK, the end of November 90, when all the tension was building for the Gulf War. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. Let's just unpack that. Oh, right. okay. I thought, so. you might, I thought you might do that. I thought you might do that. 
<laughs> that was far too much there for 90 seconds. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, you go out to Hong Kong. Uh, you're in the Hong Kong... Uh, Marine Police. Marine Police. Yeah, yeah. So what, what, what did that involve? The, most of your work was around um, drug smuggling uh, and illegal immigrants in the Marine Police uh, and other smuggling bits. So they had these, uh, these boats called cigarette boats, which had five 350 horsepower outboards on the back. And they'd put a, a car in it from China and smuggle it in Hong Kong all the other way around, or people, or cigarettes, or drugs, or whatever. And that was quite fun, if you like, trying to stop all that. And then illegal immigrants was obviously a big thing, which I must confess, I, I, I never, I couldn't get too excited by that one, because their story to leave their village in central China to try to reach Hong Kong is a tragic story. Hong Kong is an amazing place with extraordinary energy, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, I've, I've so been yeah, to Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great fun, great, um, great fun. So you, you did that for five years? Well, I did it two and a half year tour, is what you do. So okay. that, and then you, you meant to leave, but I stayed uh, and set up a marine servicing company because I was doing a lot of sailing. And also, I'm an engineer, so I can mend boats too. And I was fixing boats for people. And I realized there was a gap in the market because I was the only Chinese-speaking, non-Chinese Chinese person in the boat building business, the marine servicing business. And so if you had a boat in Hong Kong, if you gave it to a Chinese shipyard, you'd never be quite sure how well they'd look after you. But if you gave it to me, I'll give it to the Chinese shipyard because I'm ex-police, they'd look after me and we'd all do very well. I'd just look over the project for you, give it back with a little on top and everyone was happy. It was a lovely business model, it worked very well. There's good money to be made in being a middleman. Yes, there was actually. I think it was a little bit more than that because I could help interpret, make sure the design yeah. and the work done. But absolutely right. So I enable things to happen and I worked in areas with the two separate triads, so I looked after both of them and kept them happy by giving work to their boatyards. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was an interesting time, to say the least. So, so five years, half, the, uh, half in the police, half... With Manly Marine, as we called it, which transliterates into Cantonese as Manley, which means 10,000 miles, so it's a lucky name. You know, the Chinese <laughs> like lucky names. <laughs> meant my work was good for 10,000 miles at least. Which means you're knackered if you go around the world. That's 30, but <laughs> you're fine in local areas. You've run into some issues and you're off to Papua New Guinea. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I had a slight problem. A, a big super yacht came in, uh, which was the first one ever to come in Hong Kong. And uh, I got the contract to rebuild various bits of it, which we did. But then the agent stalled the payments and it all went a little bit wrong. I don't particularly want to delve into that part of the story necessarily. Yeah. But I was advised I ought to leave in a hurry. So I did. We packed it all up, paid everyone who had to be paid. Uh, uh, but then um, decided to go somewhere different. Ended up in Papua New Guinea, which is fascinating, amazing place. So and out in East New Britain. What did you do there? Recover uh, was the first thing. A uh, little bit of hiding, because I wasn't sure how many people I had actually upset. Uh, and then uh, um, I was actually going to fly for Air New Guinea. I had a job offer there in New Guinea, um, but I needed to secure some money for my business in Hong Kong, which didn't come. So after a few months there, which is just exploring and diving and what an incredible country it was. It really was fascinating. And out in East New Britain too, I thought, right, I'll, I'll come back to the UK now and start again and see what's next. And then, you know, November 90, all the tension building the first Gulf. I was in Bristol, just rebuilding, fitting out a boat down in the docks there. And I walked past a recruitment place. So I thought, I'll pop in. And there's a petty officer there. And I said, you know, I gave him my story, been out five years, you know, Hong Kong. I'm a weapons engineer. Can I rejoin? And he was very polite. He said, I think it'd be about a bit, bit too long, sir, really. But anyway, I go and see your appointer. And uh, as you know, in the Navy, it's like a matrix organization. And there's someone who looks after all the weapons engineers and is the appointer for that. Lovely dinner with the appointer. I said, yeah, I'll see what I can do. And I remember it, 15th of uh, December, I got a phone call. So, man, are you back in? You're on the Art Royal, 3rd of January, pick it up from Gibraltar, you're off to the Gulf, you're the weapons section officer, and you're a sub-lieutenant. And I said, look, one slight problem. I said, I, I left as a sub-lieutenant five years ago, I think I should be a lieutenant by now. He goes, all right, you're a lieutenant. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> even, even go, I should have gone for captain or admiral or first sea lord or something, but, but whatever. <laughs> that's, that's one way to get promoted. It is one way to get promoted. Yeah, leave for five years and come back and demand a rise. So literally, I just went to Dartmouth, picked up a new kit, new ID card, flew to Gibraltar, and went off uh, for the first goal for the Art Royal, which was interesting. Wow. And so what was that experience like? You know, I, I, I really enjoyed it, actually. I, I, I mean, we didn't have any big action. We were with the, in the med with the American Eastern Fleet. We were there in case Israel joined in, which, as you know, Saddam was throwing scuds that way all the time, trying to entice them, because then that would have made it a bigger war, and a lot of the Mediterranean states would have joined in, too. So, you know, we were at defense stations in an aircraft carrier for 50-odd days nonstop. You know, so it's just routine. 
But in weapons section, I had 170 amazing sailors I was responsible for. I really enjoyed working with them. Incredible um, uh, uh, men and women who hugely technical work, do it brilliantly. Um, with some kit, which even my dad was involved in when he was in the Navy. So, you know, procurement does take a long time, but still really effective and really worked. So it was great fun. Really enjoyed it. And then, um, <laughs> then after the Gulf, back to the UK, um, I, I, and then I ended up another aircraft carrier out to the Far East for, ni for, for th uh, six and a half months on the Invincible. Slight problem, though, going back to Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the first night in Hong Kong, I volunteered to be officer of the day, so I, I couldn't actually uh, get off the ship. And all my friends, oh, man, you know, where should we go? Where, where's a nice place in Hong Kong? And then down to Wan Chai or Lang Kwai Farm or whatever. So I volunteered for the day, so well, I'll, I'll sort it out tomorrow. And as I was on the ship and everyone had gone ashore, I had a, a pipe uh, came across a good Lieutenant Hopkinson come to the bridge. So I thought, I'll go to the bridge. And there was the Admiral and the Captain and all the television cameras. So I was actually trying to lie low, but I was on the news that night speaking <laughs> Cantonese, <laughs> trying to avoid being seen. Yeah, keep so a low profile. Keep a low profile, Get exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that didn't work out so well. But it was all fair. I went to see the Chinese boatyard, shipyard guys, and we're all mates now, so that's all fine. All's well that ends well in that respect. So that, that was that was fortunate. Yeah, it was rather, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. So uh, and how did that go then, the, 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 the subsequent tour? It was brilliant. You know, around the Far East for six and a half months, um, really enjoyed it. I love that part of the world. Um, again, it was just great working on the ship. We did some work with Americans. I spent a couple of days uh, on the Enterprise, which is interesting. They're big, but ours are so much more effective and efficient and tidy. You know, clean ship's a happy ship. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's so important. But that was just a, a really great experience. But then after that, really, there wasn't much going on. And I, and I found the pointer saying, any UN work out in Cambodia or anything like that, and nothing happening. And he did say, but we are looking for volunteers for redundancy. So I thought that was a hint I should know, <laughs> that I'd outstayed my welcome a second time. So in 93, I left the Navy second time and then became a professional sailor. Wow. So, so when you say professional sailor, what were you, what were you actually doing? Uh, driving boats, <clears throat> so all sorts of boats, uh, 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 delivering boat yachts and boats across the oceans, that sort of stuff, uh, running charter boats, private yachts, big yachts, super yachts. Um, uh, you know, when I was doing super yacht stuff, which is in the early 90s, you know, 140 foot was a big boat. Now there's 300 meters. Um, so the scale of super yachts has changed, but as a super yacht captain, it's, uh, it's great fun. And that was all over the world. It has some really dodgy boats, uh, you know, almost sinking off Casablanca and and other bits and pieces, and then picking up some beautiful boats and running them, great charters around Turkey and Greece, which is lovely. A couple of Atlantic crossings in there, which is always exciting. Uh, and, then, uh, and then that culminated in me being selected to skip in a race around the world, which is a game changer in so many ways. So how, d how did that come about? A whiskey, actually. A okay. decent glass of whiskey, about three o'clock in the morning, with a good mate of mine. So I've been a professional sailor for, for nine years. And I knew about this race called the BT Global Challenge, set up an amazing guy called Sir Jay Blythe. Uh, and it's called the world's toughest yacht race. Go around the world the wrong way, identical boats, professional skipper on each boat, and the crew were amateur. So eight of my crew had never sailed before in their life. I don't know how much sailing you've done at all, Nick. Yeah, almost none. Perfect, you'd be perfect then. <laughs> so so actually, you know, it's all about attitude rather than ability. Uh, and so I knew about this race. It happened a couple of iterations before. And I was sailing in the UK at the time, and uh, a good mate of mine, a Navy chap, uh, air arm actually, fleet and air arm, having a glass of whiskey at three in the morning, he said, Manly, you've got to do this. I just had a corporate day last week in these boats, they're brilliant. Now you be, you know, it's just right down your alley, you've got to do it. And you know how the universe sort of sends you signals when a, an idea is, is put in your mind, then you see things. I just saw an advert in the Yachting World magazine, so well, I'll apply, why not? And so the application process was great. 200 skippers eventually wheeled down to 12 on what was going to be a life-changing odyssey for everybody, including myself. Wow. And so um, what was the selection process like for that? <laughs> it was interesting, actually. So the first 200, I mean, it's quite a lot of skippers. Uh, there's all sorts of psychometric tests and this sort of stuff just to make sure you are an axe-wielding psychopath uh, and <laughs> this sort of business uh, and interviews. And then it gets down to about 40 and it's the first time you actually meet anybody when you're down to 40 skippers. We were two days down near Southampton on Calshot. And when you look around the room at all the other skippers, then you realize the, the caliber of the other sailors in the room. And I said, whoa, that lady, she's been around the world in the bathtub. Whoa, that guy's one of the famous sailors on the planet. And, and 
then you just think, well, just be yourself. You can't pretend to be anything you're not. You know, it's all quite intense. There's cameras everywhere and people walking around following you in flip charts. And so for a two-day permanent assessment, I just thought, just be manly because I can't be anything else because, you know, they'll expose that. And then you got through. Uh, and that, then I got through that in that 40 to about the last 20-something. And then invited for a day sailing. Sounds nice, but the boat is parked in the most awkward place in the marina. Uh, and Che Blythe is on there with a the television crew and a bunch of people with clipboards. And he says, right, those three people there are good sailors, been around the world already. Those three people there have never sailed before in their life. Manly, take the boat away. So can you lead? Can you sort out that disparity? Can you work under pressure? Can you actually handle a boat? And then the final bit from that, 19 got through, was a weak assessment uh, at, a, at a place in Hampshire. And what was quite funny was that we, we were, for admin purposes, we were split into three groups. So uh, essentially two sixes and a seven. And clearly you're competing against everyone else in the room because they're going to get the job or you're going to get the job. But in the group that I was in, there's a few of the, the skippers there. We just said, look, they're going to cull across the whole group, 19 down to 12. If we stick together and make each other look good, the chances are they'll cull from the other groups. So what's happened? You've given leadership tasks to do. So let's say, Nick, you are in charge of leadership tasks, but your brief wasn't very good. Rather than us exposing you as a complete incompetent buffoon, we'd say, Nick, that was really clear. Can I just um, check one little detail on that one or this or that? So we would actually actively help each other look good and, and be good. And all the, the examiners knew exactly what we were doing because it was so obvious. Now, after a briefing, we'd say things like, that was a great briefing, Nick, thanks, really got that one. You know, and we'd, but we all got through. They didn't cull at all from our group in the slightest because that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. It's not just leadership. It's can you work with each other? Can you support people? Can you part your own ego? Which is, you know, do you have humility as well as confidence? So, yeah, it was quite funny. It was. And then it all started from there. An amazing race around the world. How did they find the the non-sailors to come the, the with The crew. Well, yeah, was that a similar... Uh, no, not at all. They were all volunteers. Okay. Um, and they came from all walks of life all over the world. And my youngest was 21. The eldest was 62. Should have been 60, but he lied about his age. Eight of my crew had never sailed before in their life. They're all volunteers. They all had to pay, but only one of the guys could actually afford it. The rest had to work it. And, and we had amazing people. A little story. One, one lad, um, he's not a lad now, of course, because this is a couple of years ago now. Uh, uh, Richard, who we used to stack shells at Sainsbury's up in Macclesfield. So his nickname came known as Tesco. Uh, amazing, amazing guy. He just wanted to change his life. Uh, and he has, and he does. And he was, his story is a beautiful story that I share with youth groups and stuff because he's now a professional sailor himself, and he's a captain on super yachts far bigger than I've ever driven. But as a young lad, had never sailed, thought, I, I'm stacking shelves, I need to do something different in my life. And that's where this race is amazing because it gave people opportunity to change, to do a transformation, to make a break. But we had everything on board from a from, uh, brilliant doctor, nickname obviously Bones, a uh, policeman, Dano, Bookham Dano, Hawaii Five O. everyone had a nickname. Um, uh, engineers, um, lawyers, mothers, daughters, cousins, uncles. It was an incredible, eclectic sort of melting pot of humanity on each boat. Um, you had to make sure the boats were sort of relatively equal. Same number of old ones, young ones, boys, girls, and this yep. sort of stuff. There had been medic on board. Uh, one of the boats didn't have a doctor, they only had a vet. But I suppose it's all the same, isn't it, really? <laughs> when you're out there, <laughs> you're the horse doctor, you get your gun, don't you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> If you break a leg, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, and then Che just said, look, skippers, this is your crew. This is your boat racing around the world. If you've got a problem with any one of your crew, just to let you know, it's easier for me to get rid of you than it is a crew member because you're a hired hand and they're paid guests. So it was an extraordinary adventure. I mean, from a leadership perspective, it was, you know, you're condensing a lifetime into 18 months. The race itself was nine months. Um, and you learn so much about yourself, so much about leadership, so much about team and some extraordinary adventures along the way, as you can imagine. So do we, so once you'd got your crew assigned, was there, did you have a, a, a period of training them before you To a degree, up? yeah. I, mean, I only got my full crew together the, the day before the race started. Up to that, I had a few of them here and a few of them there. They lived all over the world. They had Aussies, Kiwis, Greeks, Canadians. Uh, and, and so you're doing it as much as you can, bit by bit. And yes, we had a couple of weeks of training. They'd done some basic training anyway, so they knew the front end from the blunt end and this sort of stuff. And for me, it was about just getting the team together. To begin with, it wasn't even the sailing. Because even though they volunteered, motivation isn't a permanent thing for nine months. You know, it waxes and wanes, and you can regret, oh, why did I ever do this? And so getting that team to be right. People are all there for different reasons too. 
someone to win, someone to change your lives, someone to just be part of a team, someone to escape from something or other. Some, it was it was amazing. And the race beforehand, they they had some awkwardness around some of the people not being able to fulfill their life properly. And so what I say to all my team beforehand is, you know, what is this race going to do for you? This race isn't the end. It's the beginning of another part of your journey. So before we even leave Southampton, I want all of us to think about what it is we're going to do when we get back. What is this race going to do to enable us to do that? And all we have to do as a leader then is look at everyone's individual journeys and make sure we fulfill them, but then just bring them together and align them, which is what we did. We were known as Team Large. Everything we did was large. And we were the only team with an identity outside the sponsor. Everyone else was... No, team Compact, Team Logica, Team LG Flaptron. We were Team Large on Olympic Group. And our sponsor, amazing guy, Angelos Cotonou, obviously Greek, so his nickname was the Large Feta. Um, you know, and he, he was magic. And he's still a friend now. And as, as a team, you know, there's still a WhatsApp group. We're all just communicating and chatting. You know, it's been an amazing adventure, amazing adventure. So the race is nine months. Nine months. So, and what, what was the route? 32,000 miles. So you're going against the current and against the wind. So it's going around the world the wrong way which does sound pretty daft, doesn't it? Because there is a right way and a wrong way. The right way is you, you go down the Atlantic and turn left, and then you go with the wind behind you and the currents behind you. The wrong way, you go down the Atlantic and turn right, uh, and then you're going against the current, against the wind. So our first leg was across the Atlantic, against the Gulf Stream, against the prevailing winds to Boston, down to Buenos Aires, which was just a fascinating leg there, and then around Cape Horn, going west and out, across the mighty Southern Ocean, all the way to Wellington, New Zealand, uh, short jump to Sydney, uh, about a week, and then back in the Southern Ocean again, around the bottom of the Indian Ocean, from Sydney all the way uh, all the way to Cape Town, and then start coming north again to La Rochelle, and then a final sprint home to Southampton, some nine months and 32,000 miles, and many bruises and smiles later. Wow. Yes. So then uh, when you... When you set off, do you do you do a leg and stop somewhere and then yeah, restock? So and you do, and and uh, and that's part of the fun. So you get to Boston. So it's not a timed thing. It's it's a it's a, a, a position thing. So do you come first, second, third, or last? So it's a scoring points, and you score points for each leg. And uh, and so you come into Boston, and then there's obviously big parties everywhere and this sort of stuff, uh, and a bit of rest and relaxation, but also a lot of rep repairing work on the boats because the boats get completely battered. Beautiful boats, really strong, but they still really struggle. Refilling all your food and that sort of stuff and you know, making sure everyone's well. So we'd have about a, a couple of weeks, I guess, maximum in each harbour. Uh, and then you start again. Another race start, boff, off you go again, racing 24-7 for 30 odd days to cover 5,000 odd miles. No, through hurricanes and storms and doldrums and whales and dolphins and yeah just life-changing stuff wow that sounds like it, it, there'd be some pretty intense moments during that yeah there were and and we had a couple of quite intense moments we did come across a hurricane uh coming down from uh, boston hurricane michael and and there's a whole story about that actually in my book amongst other places because uh, we attacked it so you, rather than run away from it, we decided to attack Hurricane Michael. And there's a nice headline on the newspapers in the UK called Hurricane Hopkinson. It's what it was all about, which is quite fun. And my premise there was I've got a bunch of amateurs on board who aren't sailors. And it's a hurricane, which is a big thing. Uh, it is a very big thing. This is one cloud the size of Brazil, so it's massive. And if you're running away from something, it's in control. If you're running away from something, you're, you're not thinking properly. You're thinking about your own protection. Your amygdala has kicked off in your brain. It's taking blood away from your cortex into your muscles. So you're not going to make the right decisions. And, and I found it's more dangerous as my team were afraid of Hurricane Michael than if we actually attacked it. So we, we got my team and I spoke through all the different motivational needs and tapped into them, knowing all my team very well, tapping into their sense of self-worth. We had quite an aggressive course where we were going to come into the side of the hurricane, but actually actively go towards the eye, but on the side of it. Uh, and when the barometer dropped to a certain rate, we knew where we were. We'd tack out, it'll go past us, we'll get a kick in the pants and come out in first place. That was the plan, uh, which worked. We did come out of Hurricane Michael in first place, which is fantastic. But what was amazing is that, and I tell the story a lot, because uh, as you know, I'm a, I'm a keynote speaker, is that in the middle of the hurricane, it was with some 30 hours, I overheard a conversation to my crew. And one was saying to the other one, you know, if we pull this rope in harder, I think we can go faster. They're trying to go faster in a hurricane. They're not afraid of the hurricane, and that's the point. And it's a lovely metaphor for so many hurricanes there are in life. You know, COVID is a big old hurricane, the finance, Ukraine, there's lots of hurricanes, and, and how do we deal with it all? 
Do we hunker down? Do we run away? Do we try to ignore it? Are we frightened of it? Or do we turn it around? Like a martial artist will turn around the energy of the opposition and use it in your favor, but also set a positive mindset around it. And, and that's one of the big things that, that we did, which is great. There's a lovely little story around that about always innovating, because we had Hurricane Michael and it's all great. But there's two stories, one on honesty and one on innovation. The innovation was, there's another tropical storm three days later called Tropical Storm Nadine. What do you think every single boat in the race did for the next hurricane? It went at it. They attacked it. They followed yeah. the same strategy we did, which is a lovely little story, isn't it? That you do something well once. Yeah, I've got it. You just can't repeat the same. Were you the only ones who went at the hurricane? The first one, yes. There was one other boat called Save the Children, ironically, who followed us in. Saw what we were doing. Uh, Army captain, Nick Fenton, actually. Uh, really top fellow. He said, oh, well, I'll have a go with that too. If Manly's going to go. I'll have a go. So they came in behind us as well. They came out in second place. And the other boats you could see from the sort of satellite mapping were trying to take avoiding strategies as much as possible, which may well have been the sensible thing. Um, but we chose differently. What was interesting, the next hurricane, everybody attacked it. You know, you could see the roots of the boats go right into the hurricane and popping out again, which is quite fun. And the honesty bit was interesting as well, because I hear leaders say a lot, frequently about you know, always say it as it is you know spades a spade and this sort of stuff and I'm a straightforward kind of guy that's not clever you gotta be aware of the impact of what you're saying so I, I, there was a conversation a couple of days after the hurricane we'd just gone through it all and I had my whole creed my whole team were on board the attacking the hurricane it's amazing experience I'm a professional sailor I'm the skipper and they're on the on the side of the boat just chatting and one of them I think it was the doctor Bones turned to me and said skipper what was Hurricane Michael like compared to all the other hurricanes you've done so I just said, what are the hurricanes? I said, what do you mean? He said, that, that was my first hurricane. But you, you didn't tell us that. Of course not. Imagine if I said, right, team, it's my first hurricane. Let's attack it. It wouldn't work, would it? Because of my body language and the confidence the way I spoke, they didn't doubt that I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing because, you know, a hurricane's just a big storm. I've done loads of storms and, and quite big ones, which are almost a hurricane. So I've done them. And you do a lot of research too. But I guess thing from a leadership perspective, sometimes... You know, calling a spade a spade isn't clever if it stops people digging the garden. You know, if you want to call it something else, it's fine. You don't, you know, it didn't lie, but it didn't open up all the truth either. So, so there's innovation, honesty, really good lessons in that one. But it, it was amazing. And it, from that moment, it changed the dynamic of the team as well. We were a tighter team, really, really tight, and uh, did amazing things. Really good fun. We didn't, didn't always have massive success, but uh, hey-ho, you know, that's the way it goes. What didn't go well? But we actually had to retire from one leg. Unfortunately, we ran out of time and ran out of food. And that was off. I'm not a vindictive kind of person, but I don't drink Madeira. I don't eat Madeira cake. And I will never go to Madeira ever, nor will my children for seven generations. Um, no, joking aside, it's a lovely place. But as we're going north, um, Madeira is quite a big volcanic rock and there's a big wind shadow, which we know about, 30 miles. I was 45 miles off, coming around to the west of Madeira. A load of boats struggling to get round to the east. We knew the new wind would come in the west looking good. Myself, two other boats were to the west. They were just in front. I could see one on the horizon a few miles away. Another one was six, seven miles in front of me. And as we sailed on beautifully, suddenly we stopped. The wind just died completely. And we were completely drifting. We had no movement. You can't control the boat. For 16 hours, we were stationary. And what had happened was that the wind shadow had come down from Madeira, but then the wind had bounced. And we had made a little private wind shadow about three miles square, exactly where we were. So then we'd missed all the new weather. And so when the rest of the team were zooming around Cape Finisterre in a storm or baiting the way through the Bay of Biscay, we were just drifting with no wind at all and just trying to make the best out of the wind we had. We ran out of food. We only had um, porridge for the last bit of food we had. And there are only so many ways you can have porridge cooked. Tabasco and porridge is an interesting connection. Uh, and then, so it was quite an emotive concept, really, because we weren't going to get into La Rochelle in time to start the last leg home, which means we wouldn't arrive back in Southampton with everybody else. So you pictured the scene, you know, you race around the world, uh, and all your friends and family have flown from all over the world to welcome you home on this particular day, because they know La Rochelle to, to Southampton is only a couple of days, so you know all the boats will arrive at the same time. You know, to a, a hero's welcome with, you know, helicopters and television crews and champagne, and we weren't going to be there. And there are some times as a leader where you have to make a decision. And there are other times as a leader where this, the decision is so profound, so impactful, that it isn't just your decision to make. You have to allow people to engage in the decision-making process. And this is one of those. Because what I was basically saying was, we're going to have to retire from this leg of the race, put the engine on, get into La Rochelle, 
and, and finish the last bit home. Now, the scene I painted was, you're not going to get home with everybody else. Is that what we want? And everyone agreed, no, no, we've got to get home with everyone else. You know, my family's flown from New Zealand, my family's flown from there. Let's finish with everybody, which means we have to leave La Rochelle at the same time as everybody else, who are already in there, enjoying the hospitality of that beautiful part of France. And we were still a couple of days out. And so he said, look, OK, so if we agree we've got to be in La Rochelle, to give ourselves any chance, just give ourselves 36 hours in La Rochelle to at least sleep, eat, prepare the boats, because we haven't eaten properly for a week now, so you're losing a lot of strength. And which means, if we take it back from there, that if we didn't reach a certain point in the ocean by a certain time, we had no option but to put on the engine. And that time came, and it was quite emotional, as you can imagine. And, uh, so we all agreed in the boat, this was the decision we made, so I put the engine on, and there was silence in the boat. But nature has a way of giving you a sense of perspective. Because no sooner we started motoring in, and people just on the boat, their own thoughts, and we saw the spout of a whale blow off just in the distance. Now, if we were racing, we wouldn't be able to go there and see it. We'd just sail past, but we weren't. So we motored towards this incredible humpback whale, same size as our boat. And for about 40 minutes, we just cruised gently alongside this whale. And it was just alongside us, a few meters away. And when it came up, it would blow and you'd smell its breath and you could feel its presence and at one stage it just rolled over slightly onto its side and its eye came out of the water this incredible black bottomless orb and he just looked at us and you're thinking what is it thinking because it's got the brain the size of a volkswagen where ours is about the size of a walnut for most people there's a hell of a lot of intelligence there you felt that presence and it's moments like that which just make you feel hugely privileged and grateful for be there and that changed the whole mood on the boat because suddenly we thought hey what it's just a race Let's just get in and kick butt in that final leg and do brilliantly. You know, nature's given a little signal, a little, well done team, you're doing brilliantly. And we're with you, we love you, it's okay. So that was really quite emotional, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and then the last leg, we did do very well. We were right up there. <clears throat> we, didn't, we didn't finish first, but we were fourth, we were literally seconds away from the first three boats, with only four or five boats at the front of the pack leading in. So, that, you know, we vindicated our move to get there. But, yeah, but what an experience. I mean, what an incredible experience. And there's so, so many other stories. I don't know how long this podcast is, but you know, three or four hours later, we could still be here and I haven't even got past Buenos Aires. <laughs> Nine months from when you left to when you got back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, with a slightly yeah. emotional uh, penultimate leg. Gosh, there were lots of emotions. Um, there are other parts where you know, we had a, a crew battling with cancer. We had to leave behind at one stage and didn't know if she had survived, but she did. She rejoined us on the boat and her story is absolutely extraordinary because um, she's still alive now, 20 odd years later, when uh, the medical world gave her six months to live. So you got some in incredible emotional stories in with this tight-knit crew in a very intense environment. Uh, you know, middle of the ocean, where you do earn, we ha you have a real sense of perspective. We had, a, we had an expression on the boat saying that if you listen carefully, the sea answers all your questions. And what we mean by that is just shut up. Just be quiet. You know, we're always on, aren't we? The phone's always on, they're always buzzing. I was on the tube just now in London and everyone's on the phone. No one's just being still. No one's stopping. There's permanent uh, stuff going on in our heads and that isn't healthy. It's not where you see clarity. Now, what would your grandmother tell you if you had a problem you couldn't solve? What would she say? Sleep on it. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, you can't yeah. solve it. Oh, just sleep on it. Yeah. But we don't do that. Because we, we think, you know, we've got a problem we can't solve. Right, quick, let's lock everyone in a room and have some blue sky thinking and, and put pizzas under the door and don't let them out until we've thought of an idea. No, no, it's completely wrong. It's completely wrong. You learn that from nature. If you've got a real struggling problem, then don't even think about it. Just go for a walk. Do something different. Have it in the back of your head. Let your brain sort it out. What's going on behind? So we had lots of deeply profound moments, some incredible sailing, some really tough bits, some deeply emotional bits, some highs and lows as well. So if you like, it was an incredible life journey just condensed into nine <laughs> extraordinary months. And everyone's changed as a result of it. Every single one of my crew is now, in their own words, a better person, a stronger person, a more aware person. Uh, uh, it's getting on, they're doing their stuff. Now, and it had a big impact on me too. So then you, you come in, the final leg, big party. Not massive. We're team large, after all, don't forget. We had large, <laughs> yeah. we had large parties everywhere. Our parties were legendary, actually. Um, we had a because there's the official function, of course, yeah. which is always there. But then we always had the large party and a couple of other boats. The logical team joined in on that one too, and a couple of others, and it was just massive. And uh, you know, the biggest party I think was in Buenos Aires, where we drank the neighbourhood out of beer and wine, 
Um, and the, the sort of eight o'clock in the morning, the landlord, the party was still going. The landlord was so upset that we drank all the beer and wine that he offered free whiskey in case he wanted to carry on drinking. Um, but no, legendary parties, big parties everywhere. But it also got me doing what I'm doing now. Because if you think about it, you, you've got incredible stories. And this is where the race is different. If it was a race of just the professionals, then the story of professionals competing is, did you win or were you first loser? And it's, no, it's not a human story in that respect. It's a performance yeah. story, but it's not, not so human. And people can't relate to it so well either. But I was very fortunate that in my race, it was normal folk all over the world. And when I tell the story, everyone in their own mind can say, That's, that could be me. It could be you, Nick. You could have been on the boat. Even as an army boy, I would have taken you. It would be fine. <laughs> it's become a, such a human element. I was very lucky that it was also televised. So we've got incredible videos to share. And then also... Um, Henley and I think Harvard got together with a group, a company called Inspiring Leadership to do a leadership study on the skippers. So it's a massive study interviewing all the crew in every port. So I'm actually the subject matter on a big book on leadership called Inspiring Leadership, not just me, the other skippers, where it exposes where Manley completely screwed up and got it wrong and what he learned and also occasionally when I got it right. So you have this perfect storm of great stories, great images and all the analysis to move into the space I'm now, which is all around leadership and that sort of stuff, which is great. What happened immediately after the race? I, I imagine you took a little bit of time to sort of... Well, we got drunk, obviously, to start with. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a bit, big woke pie, up, big hangover. Woke up the next morning and start, <laughs> started again. And eventually after... Yeah, so I was very lucky I, I got into speaking by accident, actually. Um, we were in New Zealand, Wellington, New Zealand, and I'd done quite well at the race at that stage. And so for the big official event, I was, I was up on the podium, up on the, on the top table. These big dinners invite all the local VIPs, all the CEOs, of the sponsor companies, all the local dignitaries and that sort of stuff. And they had the, the sports minister of New Zealand was going to do a talk after dinner. They had the mayor of Wellington to do a talk. They had the Commodore of the Yacht Club and then Sir Che Blythe was the final, four, the final speaker. And I was sitting in between the Commodore and Che. And as we were just clearing the table, getting ready for the speeches, Che leant over to me and said, Ah, oh, laddie, you do it. I'm drunk. I said, well, Sorry? I said, Mate, you do the speech. You'll be fine. You know, I think, well, What? You, no, what do you do? You, I wasn't ready for that. I had a few glasses of wine. And he can't read another man's speech. He was in Scottish anyway. I wouldn't understand it. And, and so I had to quickly sketch my own talk. And then I was the final speaker. And the other guys were just brilliant. How did that start off? Was it, was it through context that. You'd, you'd made from the, yeah, from the race? Well, two amazing Royal Marines, actually. Um, a chap called Chris McLeod and Rob Lewis, um, who are absolutely superb people who I knew and used beforehand and worked together. They had a brilliant company called Mission Performance, which is still going, doing brilliant, brilliant stuff. They got a few of us skippers together and said, look, great stories, great leadership. Let's do something with it. Let's make something with it and package it up and get it out there. So we worked with them for many, many years. And they're still good mates now, which is lovely. We went our separate ways only because the, the, the way the work was moving and I was doing more keynote speaking and this sort of stuff. But we're still close. We still work together. Um, but they really helped me enormously in getting that first step into the space, which was great, which is why we're still mates now. But then over the years, you're talking to business leaders and community leaders and, and organizational leaders all over the world. And you're hearing, you're hearing one of two things that everyone either wants to change direction or change speed. They either want to improve performance or they want to make a strategic change somewhere, either voluntarily or maybe the markets change. And it's a transformation. And as we know, most transformations fail. And so you start thinking why that is. And to me, it's all around the concept of commitment. That what we do when we do transformations is that we, we pull all the intellectual levers, strategy, process, organization, finance, but that doesn't actually shift people. You've actually got to do the commitment part, the behavioral part, the culture bit to align to the new direction is what the bit you've got to do. Which then got me to think, well, where does commitment come from? You research commitment and commitment's emotional, it's not intellectual. You can't intellectually commit to something. It's an emotional, it's part of your self-worth, it's part of your meaning and purpose. So then I started exploring that and the whole psychology of commitment, which then led me into the workings of the Dalai Lama uh, and reading his work on compassion. Um, if anyone knows about compassion, I think he's quite good at it. And he describes compassion saying that if empathy is to understand, compassion therefore is to work with that knowledge with positive intent. In other words, compassion is understanding with positive action. Now that's exciting. And you think of it from a leadership perspective. You think about military leadership, there's nothing more compassionate. It may, it may not seem it to the outside world, but you know, working with your troops, that your main role as an officer in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, is to look after the troops. It's to enable them to be the best they can be, to really know them deeply and feed them and motivate them, inspire them, give them that direction, give them the confidence, give them the courage to go and do this sort of stuff. And so the concept of compassionate leadership was born. 
um, which actually translates as a beautiful model saying if compassion is to understand and act positively, compassionate leadership is to secure the best for all. So if I secure the best for you, well, that's how the best I'm going to get best from you because I'm tapping into your self-worth. And that's the whole psychology of commitment, this sort of stuff. And hence my work with the Dalai Lama and his team now and the, all my work on compassion leadership. And, th and that's my life's purpose now. You know, my, my, my book was published in 2014. Um, so I've been one of the leading voices on compassion. I disagree with many of the other voices out there. But they link compassion to trauma and suffering. I, I think that's rubbish. I think it's in the everyday. I think compassion is passing the salt to somebody. It's opening the door. It's being considerate. It's being nice. It's being kind. It's recognizing other people have needs and then acting positively on those needs. Obviously, it's great around trauma, but you don't need trauma to be compassionate. You and I can be compassionate now, tomorrow, or discompassionate if we decide to stay in our own world and just look after ourselves. So that's been the journey. And you know, now we've got the Compassionate Leadership Academy out there, and that's all really exciting. And I, sometimes I do pinch myself, though. Nate, you know, I'm just a, a matlow. <laughs> I don't have any qualifications in what I'm doing at all. Um, Apart from you know the early Dartmouth training, that's where it all started from. Some, some incredible experiences. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. And I did do a North Pole as well with uh, with, with my marine mates. Uh, how long did that take to to write? The, the book was fascinating because I, 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 people kept saying, "Man, you got to write a book." You know, you've got the stories and the learning, the leadership, and I, and I wanted it as a handbook, not not just a novel or a memoir. Because there's, I don't know, the, the memoir is all about me, but this is what I wanted to do was to share the learning and help other people engage. And so that was the process. So I sort of mapped it out and got a synopsis of what it looked like and took it to a publisher who said, yeah, Manny will have this, great. Can you do it by September, whatever year it was? I said, yes, of course I can. But then I struggled. I struggled to find the time to actually do it. And I tried a ghostwriter at one stage, but they didn't say hurrah enough. And it's not me, and it's, <laughs> and it's, it's my voice. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I, I had it all mapped out, but then I was doing some work in the States an old series of work, uh, talks on the East Coast, and I was up near New York and had five days spare, and I thought, I'm not going to fly back to the UK. You know what, I'm going to find a little quiet place. So I looked up on the map, up in the Ariondacks, the national park in the, near Saratoga Springs, up in North New York State, and I found a little red dot on Google Maps, middle of nowhere, which is actually a cross-country ski lodge, and this was in the autumn, so it's closed. I thought, perfect. So I phoned the guy up, and he said, yeah, but we're closed. Perfect, can I just come anyway? Because yeah, you can, keys under the map. So I just got enough food and wine for five days. And for five days, I just wrote, ate, drank, slept, swam in the lake, went for a run, and 60,000 words just sort of flowed in the five days. It was cathartic. It was magic. Wow. And, th and then the joy is working with an editor. Um, yeah. Little Brown Books, Piatkas is the, is the brand, part of the Hachet Group. When you work with a... a now you think you're smart with all the words you've written down. You work with an editor. They're holding every single one of those 62,000 words in their conscious memory. And they're saying things like, Manly, that paragraph there in chapter eight, you repeated that statement in chapter two. And I think, really? I, I wouldn't know. I wrote it, but I wouldn't know. And, and so that was magic experience. And then you know, we published in 2014. And, and one thing I, I mentioned earlier I'm really proud of is the accommodation from the Dalai Lama on the front of the book. Because um, I sent a copy to him and said, look, you know, I'm inspiration. And he very kindly read it and said, oh, well done, mate. <laughs> nice one. Good work and compassion. And also on the back cover, an amazing endorsement from someone we'll all know in the military world is John Adair, task team individual. One of the classics that we're all brought up with and you would have met at, da uh, at, at Sandhurst and Dartmouth and Cranwell about balancing the time because that profoundly changed my life. Even Hurricane Michael. I drew the three, drew all the three circles on the side of the chart. To remember, it's not just about the hurricane. This is an opportunity for the team, and I need to look after the individuals too. Uh, and so I said, when I wrote the book, there's a whole chapter on his stuff. So I sent him that. I said, look, John, I mean, I'm talking about you. Do you mind? And he was very kind. I said, oh, Manny, I like this. Thank you. And he wrote very kindly on it as well. So it's been well received, um, which is great. Um, and you know, I, I love the process. It's slightly scary when you publish a book because it's quite personal, and you're exposing yourself to critique which it did. We've only had two bad reviews, one saying they didn't like the cover, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> but whatever, you know, you can't please everybody, can you? <laughs> no, you don't. What do you say about that? Uh, yeah. So I, 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 I've been listening to it on audiobook, ah, so actually having yeah. the conversation <laughs> with you now and hearing your voice that, that talking to me is uh, it's very different from having you talk to me in the car, uh, which... You recognise some of the stories there, don't you? Uh, it yeah. was, it's a funny thing with the audiobook, because I felt I had to do it. 
because you know, it's me. You've it's got a great voice for my, audio yeah, books. A great voice for radio, a great face for radio as well. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Someone says I ought to be follow on from David Ashborough when he pops his clogs. <laughs> Um, but, that wouldn't uh, be a bad move. No, 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 I'll be quite over that too. Uh, but no, yeah, so that was great. And doing the audiobook was super as well. And, and you know, working with professional audio people, as you know, is the best way to do it. I had a you know, great studio team helping me get it all right. And then we created the Compassion Academy on the back of that, which is a whole program of work um, to try and make it all accessible uh, and to do leadership and personal development at scale. And that's what I really love, because but that's now all over the world, four languages. We've got a brilliant pilot with the healthcare we're working at the moment down in Brighton, which hopefully will fundamentally shift the culture of healthcare. And I'm really excited by that. Really, really excited by that as well. That's uh, that, yeah, that's quite some achievement. So then, um, you, you you briefly mentioned it earlier, a trip to the North Pole. Yeah, with a couple of Marines, which is always okay. quite handy. So like, let's. Yeah, well, let's was, hear that story. This is with the Mission Performance guys again. We've been working together a few years and, and really enjoying each other's company and doing good work, really good work. And we felt, look, we can't just rely on one story. We need more stories. Uh, you know, Global Challenge is super, but let's have more stories. And we thought, what a good idea. We're in the pub. And someone suggested, look, there's this inaugural race, the Magnetic North Pole. It's the first time we've ever had a race where everyone starts at the same place, same time. Shall we do that? I said, yeah, yeah, why not? And so I teamed up with an amazing guy, Chris McLeod and Phil Ashby. Uh, both Royal Marines. Um, Chris, extraordinary chap, eight years younger than me, supremely fit, brilliant, brilliant skier, you know, SBS trained, chest full of medals from all his work he's done. Phil Ashby, he won the Queen's Gallantry Medal for amazing work in Sierra Leone, working in the United Nations. He was in the Mountain Leader card of the Royal Marines. Um, you know, eight years younger than me, brilliant skier. Then, then Manly, this funny old Matt Lou, who'd never done any cross country skiing before in my life. And so you're obviously being a bit polite there, Nick. You're not asking why did they just not get another Royal Marine get it done? Why was I there? Good question. Uh, I thought I'd ask it for, answer it for you so you didn't have embarrassment. I said, Mandy, why the hell did they pick you? I'm annoyingly optimistic, which is quite handy when it's minus 50 degrees centigrade, quite chirpy. Uh, and also, I'm not a bad navigator. Uh, and, and when you're on ice like that, it's, it's sea navigation. It's the same navigation as being on water because it is on water. And so doing that was a good bit I could add. And also, for my race around the world, I've done a lot of research on... Are you saying the Marines were poor navigators? Is that no, no, they're bloody good, actually. <laughs> um, but I was a sailor, you know. <laughs> they like navigating on land with a little bit of close water. They'll do coastal navigation, you yeah, know, just to okay. make sure yeah. they get their rib going in the right direction. Yeah, aim for the waves. OK, got it. <laughs> oh, I'd never criticise a Marine because it'll come back and bite you anyway. Well, they will, literally. Um, and frankly, even, where, even through the whole of the North Pole bit, actually, and this won't surprise you, any Royal Marine listening to this, when we got to the North Pole, both Phil and Chris disappeared into the tent and came out in a little black dress because Royal Marines always have a little black dress in their bottom of their Bergen, and it's absolutely true. They do. So, yeah, we, we did that I also. So I did a lot of work on, on, on the, the, the psychology and physiology of extreme sport and with all the Royal Marine bit. We did so, some good stuff. So just the three of you yeah. on skis... How far did you go? It was 365 miles. Uh, we, were, we did it. We did the whole lot. We, we set a record of 10 days and nine hours, which still hasn't been beaten. But we did some clever stuff like running 20-hour days, not 24-hour days. The sun never set. We we're eating 10,000 calories, 8,500 calories a day, which is a nice load of food. There's a challenge when you're listening. Try and eat 8,500 calories in a day and see who are. But we, were, we lost weight because we we're burning around 10,000 yeah. calories. It was massive. It was great fun. Incredible experience. Very, very different. Three guys, really intense, um, all around performance, but not killing each other in the process. And we did say that our mission was to become first, but not at all costs, and not to compromise the team. And we're still good mates now, which is super. Uh, and that was 20 years ago. So, right. yeah. And how many teams? Uh, how many teams? There were four that? teams in this race, and we did. But one other team, with a, with a, an army chap in it, a chap called Tony Martin, uh, and and a jockey, Richard Dunwoody. Um, so they were a team of two, so quite light, quite nimble. Army commando as well, so he's an army, but he also got his greenberry, so really quite an accomplished guy. And Richard Dunwoody, champion jump jockey, had the mindset of a champion, which means you're going to do more than anybody else to win, because that's what champions do. doesn't yep. matter what your sport is. And they were a good competition. Um, they were a good competition, but we did beat them. It's all right. Would you, were you... Were you able to like, see the other teams? Well, to begin with, because you had a start line again. So you, you were there, but you, you, we sort of shake them off and, and, and doing things differently all the time. I mean, even the first camp, you know, we, when, you, when you sleep or you're making a call. Because the biggest problem actually isn't cold when you're moving. You're too hot when you move. And so you're not wearing a great deal. You've got a thin shell suit and some 
So it's a base layer and zips open everywhere to, to get the heat out. But anything exposed, like fingers and nose and stuff, will freeze. But when you stop, you freeze instantly because you know, the wind chill will take it to below minus 50, minus 60, still air minus 40. Um, and so you have to get in your tent pretty quickly. And we did a bit of a trick on the first first day out that when we stopped to make our radio call back to base because you had to make a, a satellite, satellite phone call back to base. And the polar team, their strategy was good, first leg of the race. They just followed us. They were just 200 metres behind us. That was their strategy. We do all the hard work, break the trail, do all the navigation, do all this sort of stuff. They would just follow us, relaxed, you know, just in our wake, and, and so accelerate past us at the checkpoints and therefore win that leg of the race. That was their plan, brilliant plan. So we had to shake them off somehow. So um, the first time we put our tent up, we didn't do it properly. We saw them putting their tent up, saw them get in and do it properly. Knew as soon as we got inside the tent, they put the stove on, which is noisy. As soon as we heard their stove go, we broke our tent down and disappeared, and we shook them off. So, you know, even the lesson out is doing something different, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, trying to shake off the competition, trying to do something. But they, it was a good race, really, really good race and, and beautiful. We had a couple of polar bear incidents. Uh, that um, was, I was about to ask, did yeah. you run into any polar bears? We did, actually. And, and again, um, we used my hurricane strategy um, of attacking it, actually. <laughs> it's, there's a, there's a that seems there. bold. <laughs> well, it is bold, right? But consider it. And this is compassion. I, I write saying that compassion made me attack the polar bear. It sounds counterintuitive, but think about it, right? Polar bear lives in hunger all the time. Males don't even hibernate. We represented, the three of us, a few hundred thousand calories. If we ate three, two Royal Marines and a sailor, it's a shed load of calories. All their prey normally runs away. So when, when, a, when a polar bear sees a seal, it'll try and escape. So if we ran away, its instinct would click in and it would just follow us. A polar bear can cover 50 meters in four seconds. He can do it quicker than Usain Bolt. It can accelerate, and it's 600 pounds. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's 200 and something kilos. It's a massive beast. And so you can't just do the normal. Don't act like a seal. You know, stop balancing a ball in your nose and things like that because it, it can't stop itself. And so we just came around a big iceberg, and there's this polar bear in front of us, which we worked out had been tracking us for a few days. And as soon as you saw us, it, it stopped. It made a split decision saying, do I go and kill or do I stop because it's all three of us? And I said, right, okay, I wasn't allowed near the gun, of course, because I'm a sailor, and a sailor with a gun is dangerous, as you know. Phil had the gun. Chris got his skis ready to make a noise, and I got the camera. I thought, I'll, I'll phone it. I'll video it, so at least people know how we died. And, and it was an amazing experience, because the, the bear stopped, took a look. They thought, oh, no, I'll go for that. I'll have this, and just started walking towards us. And when they're in attack mode, they, they swing their head from side to side, so they're zeroing in, just getting you know, better, better angles uh, on it all, which, you know, I mean, they're very well, a bit of gunnery. Uh, and, and, and they even start walking, they'll zigzag their walk as well and just work out which one, who's the fattest, who's going to be the slowest, which one shall I get? Shall I go for the guy with the gun, the guy with the camera, or the guy with the skis? And, and it, Phil fired a shot above his head and, uh, uh, and it just kept moving forward. Fired a shot in front of the ice, it kept coming closer. Fired a, a bear scare, it's like Chinese fireworks in a shotgun cartridge. And the bear just stopped, looked at it, looked at us and carried on walking. And this is now getting a bit tense because we actually only had 10 rounds of ammunition and that's three gone already. And we're thinking, you know, the fourth one, it's, it, it's got to work. And uh, actually, it's quite funny. As an aside, I remember telling this story up in Scotland. I was doing a talk in Glasgow. And clearly, I'm not from Glasgow. And uh, as you know, for some people, there's a little bit of tension sometimes with the English and the Scottish. As I was telling this story, it's a big, big hall in, in, in Glasgow. And I was telling the, the tension, building the tension up. And I say, you know, the bear's coming closer. And I said, and the next shot will have to kill the bear. But what I normally do in my talk is I press the button and the video shows what happens, where nobody dies. But as it happens in this big hall in Scotland, when I, when I said, and the next shot will kill the bear, this lady stood up in the crowd and said, no, you English bastard, it's better you die. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice friendly audience there. Uh, but yeah, it was amazing. So we just marched towards the bear. We thought we've got to close on to the bear. If we run away, the bear's in control. If we stand still... It's a stalemate, and we can't stay here. And we're running out of cartridges, and we did not want to kill the bear. That would have been tragedy, and I could never have told the story, and I'd have hung my head in shame. So we just literally marched towards the bear, just making noise, getting closer and closer and closer. And it unnerved the bear. The bear just thought, hang on a second, this is not normal. And then one little last shot, the ice, bit of ice kicked him in the face, and the bear thought, sod that. It ran away about five metres, then just stopped and looked at us, and sat in a bit of iceberg, licking his paw like a nonchalant cat, and, uh, and thought, no, we'll leave us alone. And so we just backtracked, keep an eye on it, put the skis back on, and went around the corner. 
And uh, we saw it again a few days later. Um, we think it was the same bear. Uh, when we are in our tent and I was woken up with a, the tent hitting my face. And the first thing you think is bear, but it wasn't, it was the wind. The wind had built up so strong that it was just squashing the tent. And we were lying in the tent thinking, well, this isn't great. I was volunteered to go outside and check the weather by the two Royal Marines, of course. I was the sh SVO, ship's volunteer officer. And I went outside, because sometimes you're in a tent, it sounds worse than it is when you're outside. And it was horrendous. You can't even stand up and it's just a whiteout. And as I sort of looked up upwind and I turned around to go look downwind and this, look, look over the tent, literally 10 metres south of the tent, downwind of the tent, was the polar bear just sitting there looking at me, thinking, oh, breakfast, thank goodness for that. And so I told the guys, polar bear just downwind, and Chris stuck his head out the other end of the, the tent, went, Rah! and the polar bear ran away. <laughs> and so, so we thought, we can't stay, we've got to go. Yeah. And so we had to pack the tent and go in that incredible weather. Um, which got quite exciting, and Chris froze his corneas, amongst other things. So, yeah, we had, we had a lot of stories in there, too. <laughs> wow. But we won. We did really well on that one. I didn't win the sailing race, but we won the skiing one. So that was all right. Well, that's quite some trick. It was. So uh, w what did you do to prepare for that? Um, well, actually, it's quite fun. It's a mixture of a lot of exercise, but also a lot of eating, because you want to put on some blubber before you go. So you can get stuck into the beer and the pizzas and all sorts and extra little carbo loading and go for a run and do this sort of stuff. Dragging tires around. You'll see people dragging tires for this cross-country ski training, which is great. We you know we, we, we did a lot of that. Most of it's in the head, though, Nick, as I'm sure you'd imagine, like all these things are. You, know, you can be the physically fittest person, but if you fall apart mentally, you're, you're gone. So it's, it, I think 80% is mental. So we were pretty fit. I mean, that wasn't an issue. Um, and we drove ourselves pretty hard. We had a real lot of discipline. You know, when we had a break, um, we only had seven minute breaks. Seven's exact, it's angular, it's a prime number. We never ever broke the seven minute rule. And if you like, that was the external manifestation of our internal discipline. And that's something I share a lot with people. You know, we, success only comes from internal discipline. Whether you're in a business or a charity or the army or on a ship, it doesn't matter where you are. The sports team, if you don't drive yourself or do what you have to do, which you know you've got to do, then nothing else changes. So, yeah, that was great. And it was a great experience. And it got me hooked into cross-country skiing. I love it. Backcountry skiing, I try and go every year go and do something different. As well as sailing, I, I just the two things I love. Yeah, I, I, I've done it once. Um, and uh, it's, it's a bit of a thigh burner. <laughs> <laughs> Skinning up a hill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It's good, eh? You earn your height. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah, and then you spend an hour and a half skinning up. And it, it five minutes and coming down. Yeah. Five minutes coming down. And you start over again. Yeah. Yeah, good though, isn't it? You see, and even now when I go skiing with the family, I'll get up early a few mornings and skin up um, you know, before everyone starts getting busy. Um, get to the top, I like that. Yeah, yeah I, I've only done it once. I did it with the army. And um, yeah, hard, hard work. But yeah, you do really feel like you've, You've earned the fun of coming down. Yeah, you have. It, it, it's meditative too. Like I was saying at the sea, and listen carefully, you know, it's, it's peaceful when you're in your own head. It may not be peaceful in your army when you shout it out to go quick, I don't know. But when you're doing it voluntarily, you're in your own space, in your own head, and you're skinning up these mountains in Kyrgyzstan or um, Iceland or wherever we are uh, with a bunch of mates I still go with, you get into this state of meditation, almost zen-like, in this zone, because the rest of the world just stops. I was I surprised it. how sweaty you got in freezing yeah, temperatures. Yeah, you do, and that's the point. So you're actually not wearing, like I said, North Pole. Yeah. Everything's unzipped. You're not wearing much at all because uh, you're kicking out so much heat. And that's a problem because, you know, if you sweat, you lose water, and there's no easy water there. You've got to melt ice. Also, what you find is that the water gets inside the material, which then freezes in the material, and the material just breaks and delaminates. So if, if your kit gets wet and then it's frozen, you imagine that shirt getting wet and freezing, the ice crystals will push the threads apart and everything just falls apart so quickly. Um, which you don't want when you're no, up it, in the Arctic. No, it doesn't sound North Pole. optimal. No. no, it's not optimal. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when, when was the, the polar expedition? Well, it's amazing, really. I, I'm still talking about it, isn't it? So the, the race around the world was 2000, polar expedition 2003. I haven't done a massive one since. We got very close again to the South Pole, um, had a whole team together sponsors but then fortunately the sponsor to pull out penguins are a lot less dangerous than polar bears they, they, they are it's you can run into penguins and you, you can yeah, it's that's a lot fine they can, they can peck your knees and that's about <laughs> it emperor penguins may peck slightly higher which you've got to look out for but no you're right it's a very different threat but it's a different scale too 
And also, you know, North Pole, your sea level, Antarctica at 3,000 metres. So there's an altitude element in there too. So a bit disappointed that we, we tried for many years and no response was sorted. And circumstance happened, you know, like one of our sponsors was BP, then the Gulf of Mexico thing kicked off. Another one was a watch manufacturer that sponsored Renault Formula One and then Renault pulled out of Formula One and destroyed all their stock. And so, so things like that, things happen. Uh, and and it wasn't meant to be. It's still there, though, and I'm still here, so, you know, it still can. So every year or every couple of years, I, I try and do something chunky, if not the South Pole, North Pole, try and do something, at least some bit of sailing or a bit of, uh, bit of backcountry skiing. I mentioned Kyrgyzstan the other day. I'm, I've got a, I'm taking a yacht over to the to Antigua in December, which would be nice. It's across the ocean, I like that again. I love ocean sailing. So what, what, what is normal life at the moment then? Normal's an interesting word to use. It's not one I aspire to necessarily. <clears throat> it's very mixed because you know, I, I'm, I'm a speaker, I have my consultancy business. Um, as I said, this pilot we're running in the healthcare is really, really exciting. Um, over the last 12 years, I've also sat on the board of various companies. I, I call myself director of people and performance, not full time a few days a month, essentially like an exec, non-exec kind of role, where you're trying to change the culture, and it's much easier to do it from the inside than from the outside, all around the principle of compassion and compassion leadership. Um, I, I do travel a fair bit all over the world, which is nice. Um, I do a lot of work out in Africa, and I love going to Africa. Um, I, I live down in Limington on the south coast, which is nice. I'm a sailor, um, you know, so I have to sail, so I do that. And so every, every week is different. Now my, my kids are, are leaving the nest now. My son's 20, my daughter's 18. So they've unfortunately caught the adventurous bug. Um, my son started university, there's knocked it on the head and he's off to Thailand. Then he's going to become a yoga instructor in Bali. Then he's going to go work on super yachts. And my daughter is today just driving down in Cornwall to go and do some surfing for a week and then she's off to do something. I don't know what, but how exciting is that? Right, okay. <laughs> so what's the, what, what's the next big, big project that you're going to... Well, the next big project is the Compassion Asian Academy bit and getting to where I wanted to get to. We're looking at actually getting it translated in Ukrainian at the moment as well and then offering it to um, Ukrainians over here but also to business industry and, and Ukrainian leaders out there. We have a charity foundation around the academy, which is where that comes from. So we're trying to get it out to people. We know it'll make a fundamental difference as well as businesses and business leaders. We're trying to get it to... We have conversation trying to get into the prison system. So rather than people coming out of the prison system and reoffending who've got no choice, they'll come out with a qualification. Um, you know, it, it's accredited by the Institute of Leadership. It's CPD accredited, so they can come out with life skills, accreditation, something they can put on their CV and help them. So we're trying to do good with it, uh, and that's the big drive. And that makes me feel great. So I'm, I'm very selfish, really, in, in the sort of just feeling good with the work I do, which I enjoy. I feel very grateful for it. Um, so that's the drive really the next few years is to is, is doing well in business, which is nice. So we obviously need to do more. Um, it's still at the early years, you know, that bottom of the bell curve bit. But I really want to get it out to places where I know it's going to make a difference. And that's the exciting bit. We've got a lovely pilot with uh, the school system, the school leavers. Had a nice little work in some universities, get it out to the people coming out into the world. See, what, what we forget about when we're in the forces is that when we joined up as, as young lads and young ladies at 18, 19 years old, where it was, we were there and leadership was on the agenda every single day, either deliberately taught, but also in the circumstances we were put in. And we were nurtured and trained and exposed and given feedback, brutal feedback at times on leadership. Everything was there. That doesn't actually happen in Civvy Street. It doesn't happen at all. It's an extraordinary luxury and a privilege that we forget from the forces that other people just don't have it. So what happens in industry is that people come out of school, they're technical, they go and do something, they get promoted on their technical competence. So the best salesperson becomes a sales manager, which by definition, they may be the best salesperson because they're dysfunctional as human beings, they shouldn't be a manager. Yeah. And it's only later we think, oh, well, you're leading people now, quick, go and do some training. And, and so they don't have the extraordinary privilege and luxury that we do, which is an amazing thing to fall back on. And so I really want to make sure that I'm, we're helping youth come out into the, into the work environment with the life skills, with the, the training that we had, or some of it, without the shouting and the beasting and Dartmoor and various other places like that, uh, and the Brecon Beacons and things, which you'll obviously know very well. And, and, and so that's our focus, is to get it into the young people, get it to the people coming into the market, get it into the people who are struggling in life, the offenders, the, that sort of stuff. Um, parts of the world where don't really access this this, have access to this kind of stuff. 
and it's designed it's quite clever it's using technology and not ai i'm not doing that don't, don't need to at this stage it's uh, uh online and hybrid and so it's accessible it's all different languages and I, I, that really excites me i must admit so how do people find it easy to find compassionate leadership academy if you just google that you get there or you can find it through me manly there aren't many manlies out there doing silly things so manly compassion works and you know we've designed it so it's accessible and affordable to uh, really to we don't plug it any more than that to say but thank you i'm really excited by it really really excited by it i must admit and i and i, I love it you know you get up in the morning and think yeah right how exciting is this what change what difference can we make today you know what impact can we make uh, and i think the, my fire. the book on audible is is, is fantastic <laughs> it's quite fun thank you for that it is interesting the book because it's clearly my voice and a friend of mine, she was reading the book book in, in bed and she thought, you know, when she was reading in bed, she said, Manny, I had to stop reading in bed because I felt you were alongside me. I, <laughs> so, sorry about that. <laughs> but what I really like and I get joy from is when people send me pictures of the book or they post pictures of the book looking all dog-eared and tattered with corners folded over and scribbles made in, in, the, in the margins and that. So it's, it's, it's become a living book, a useful book, as opposed to one just gathering dust on a shelf. I wouldn't want it to be there. So I, I, I thank you for the copy you, you've given to me. I'm going to share it with my wife. So my, my wife's uh, uh, just got to the level of being in a leadership position oh, in, a, in a company in the city. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to share it with her. And do you have kids at all? We do, yeah. I have, how, two, I have two girls. How old? Uh, almost five and Perfect. almost two. The chapter on power and influence, you'll love that one. You'll absolutely love that one. For Parrington, all parents turn to that chapter because, you know, how do we influence our kids? Um, how do we ask, get them to do what we want them to do? Especially when they get to teenage years. You, know, you have that one ahead of you. So make sure you read the book beforehand. You'll like that. <laughs> if you were to have a conversation with someone who was coming to the end of a military career, uh, what would be the advice you would give to them? You've just had the most extraordinary life experience and training that doesn't happen to 90% of the population of the world. Back yourself, trust yourself. You are extraordinary, truly extraordinary. Don't be arrogant, be humble. You will miss elements. The camaraderie is not the same. That sense of purpose and meaning isn't always the same. And when we join the forces, we join knowing what it's all about. We know the culture. We know the purpose. We know what we're in for. We know what our colleagues are like. Our early training helps expose us to ourselves. It's not designed to break us. It's designed to help us be real and be authentic. So you've been working for a number of years with a group of truly authentic people who are joined culturally with a single sense of purpose and mission. So the team strength and collaboration that is absolutely extraordinary. You will not be able to repeat that. It will not be the same, and you will miss that. It doesn't mean you don't get good teams. You do get good teams. But just be ready for that bit, because I think that's the bit that, that we tend to forget, and we move into industry and elsewhere, and it isn't quite the same, and it isn't quite the same of singular purpose, and the difference in people and their motivation and their intent is, is different as well. And... The level of sort of politics that people play is different. But trust yourself because you are amazing. And your leadership skills you've had and the experience you've had is second to none. Absolutely second to none. Um, so get out there and make it happen. And when you do get a team, don't ever forget those three circles of John Adair and spend time building that team. And you can create that camaraderie. You can build it. But like Nick, you invited me here today. Don't forget about the incredible network you have as well. Because the military network, the veteran network is something quite extraordinary uh, and don't be afraid to tap into it because we all know each other to a degree i've never served with you your army i'm navy but I'm still in the same room we haven't had a fight yet but we know where we both come from and we know the value set we both hold and that is beautiful really powerful thank you so much for your time today i've, I've really enjoyed our, uh, our conversation it's been brilliant thank you thanks nick i've enjoyed it too cheers